Okay, so I'm going to talk about risk assessments for gates other than radial gates. Um, we're going to cover uh, essentially the most, uh, the next most popular gates that we have. Most of these gates are on river, uh, riverine structures, our nav locks and dams, uh, the spillways associated with those. Uh, pretty much nowadays, what we're building uh, are miter gates and tainter gates or radial gates. Um, most of these are historic type gates. Uh, we will cover miter gates at the end, um, but we still have them in our inventory and these gates can be found on other projects, depending on your era, um, the era that the dam was constructed in. So what are the learning objectives? So uh, first describe the different types of gates and their vulnerabilities. Um, so we're gonna walk through, you know, we're not gonna go into detail on some of these gates because honestly, there's so many details on, for example, a drum gate or a roller gate that we just can't cover. Um, but this is really just to kind of expose you to the fact that a lot of these gates have unique vulnerabilities. Um, so construct, how to construct an event tree to represent a gate failure, we'll touch on one at the end and then estimate event probabilities and breach probability. So we're gonna start off with drum gates. All right, so a drum gate um, is essentially a gate that's gonna be hinged and it's essentially a submerged type gate. And in order to raise the gate, we're flooding a chamber because uh, this drum gate is uh, essentially a hollow sealed structure. Uh, some of them are filled with styrofoam. Uh, they shouldn't be most of the time, um, but as you can imagine, whenever you have uh, mechanical and electrical components that you need to operate this gate, most of these components are embedded in concrete or underwater. Um, they're gonna be subject to corrosion, um, uh, sediment, and uh, pretty much flooding the chambers constantly. And these are major maintenance items on these types of gates. So some of the vulnerabilities would be, you know, the float inlet well uh, developing leaks. Uh, the primary failure mode that we've seen is inadvertent lowering of the gates. Uh, because drain lines are damaged and they leak, uh, valves are leaking, things like that. So most of the failures that we have for these gates are kind of mechanical in nature or operational in nature. And from a risk assessment standpoint, it's very difficult to estimate uh, probabilities of failure for these types of um, um, components. So seismic loading is a major vulnerability, not because of anything inherent to the gate itself, but just because most of the drum gates are, I should say all of the drum gates that we have in our inventory are built in the 1920s and 30s. Um, so back then earthquakes didn't really uh, pop into the mind of the structural engineers for a design consideration. And um, some of these drum gates can be, you know, 120, 135 feet long. And they're essentially, um, you know, structural members that are turned on their side. So, there's gonna be a lot of components that um, could fail during an earthquake. So here's a list of the drum gates that are in uh, the inventory of, of USACE and USBR. So, you, so we compiled all the gate years of operation. Uh, so this is from 2016, so we have I don't, I, we, I don't remember any failure since 2016. But this is what we have. So in 2016, we had 4,500 gate years of operation. And since we had, you know, essentially two failure modes, we can use the gate years and operations and the number of failures that we have to just come up with a very rough annualized probability of failure. This is kind of what we do on some of these unique gates. Um, so we're looking at, you know, inadvertent lowering. So it's an uncontrolled release of pool downstream. So we'll just use historical data to come up with a, a, a starting point for a lot of the, the um, failure modes. So the two uh, incidents that I was referring to are shown here. So at uh, Guernsey Dam in Wyoming, uh, one of the two drum gates at the south of the spillway opened. So this was caused because a painting contractor left trash in the, inside the gate and that trash eventually plugged the drain line. So if the gate couldn't uh, drain, the water started collecting inside the drum gate, it starts to get heavier, loses its buoyancy, sinks back down into, uh, into the sill. Um, but since, like I said, most of these gates are part of a riverine structure, the channel capacity is much higher um, than the outflow for, through a single gate. So there was no life loss associated with it. 
at Hoover Dam, um, one of the drum gates dropped without warning and essentially tore up the tunnel lining. And so again, no life loss, no uh, life loss risk associated with this failure mode, but it was an uncontrolled release of pool and uh, there was significant uh, cost to repair the damage that was caused. And at PG&E, uh, PG&E's Cresta Dam, which, which is on the North Fork of the Feather River, um, there was another incident. So on July 5th, 1997, the left drum gate began to drop uncontrollably. Um, it only took about 20 minutes to completely lower and the downstream water level rose about uh, 14 feet. So again, no injuries, no fatalities recorded. Um, but you can see how, you know, this inadvertent lowering, you can increase the discharge in the channel. And if this, if this occurred for multiple gates or occurred on a channel that had a limited channel capacity, uh, a 14 foot rise in your tailwater, you know, that that's significant that could flood people. So the risks are, um, very real. So. The root cause, again, was the drum gate drum line prevented the removal of water from inside the gate, loses buoyancy, and it starts to um, lower inadvertently. So with three known incidents in 4,500 years of operation, uh, the annual probability of failure here is 6.6 .6 times 10 to the minus four. Um, then add six years with uh, to get it to current day numbers. And you can kind of see that this annual probability of failure um, is going to continue to decrease as long as we don't have failures, right? Um, you can kind of think of this like if you're working on a USACE or USB projects and these are our inventory, it's kind of like a lower bound, right? These are the incidents that we have recorded. There could be incidents that we don't have recorded that could increase this failure rate. So just don't take this number and use it on a risk assessment, but this gives you an idea of how you can develop uh, failure rate for a gate of some construction. Um, maybe you don't have data um, and you can probably refer to some of these gate failure rates uh, to kind of, you know, use your judgment and develop your own failure rates. Uh, so next we're going to talk about roller gates. Um, so roller gates are kind of, I wouldn't say similar. So they're similar in regard that it's a big hollow structure and it's using its buoyancy to help raise the gate. But a drum gate is operated by hoist uh, machinery that's on top of the pier. So if you want to imagine in your head, uh, just your typical riverine structure where you have tainter gates, make the tainter gate bay wider, put some hoist houses on top, and we're hoisting from kind of that same area. So we use a chain, uh, there is a pinion on the drum gate itself, and it's rolling on a uh, rack, which is essentially a linear type gear. No mechanical engineers in here to correct me, right? Good? All right. Um, so you can see there's some vulnerabilities. This rack and pinion is actually submerged. We do add shields to the side of the drum gate, um, but you can end up getting debris inside of it. Um, and there's other failure modes associated uh, with this type of construction that I'll get into in a little bit. Um, so roller gates, again, are more commonly found in older, low head navigation dams. Uh, sometimes they are uh, constructed with skirts. Sometimes, um, you know, the, typically the details aren't really standard, I guess I should say. So for roller gates and the previously covered drum gates, you always got to take a deep dive into what details um, you're looking at. Um, so with these older gates, they're typically riveted structures. And... So since these were built in the 20s and 30s, and then we started modifying these gates or repairing these gates, um, before we, I guess, had a better idea that we shouldn't weld to riveted steel because it's a high carbon steel, it's not really a weldable steel. Um, we're doing two things. We end up um, changing the metallurgy around those welds, make them more susceptible to fatigue cracking. Uh, sometimes whenever we weld something, um, onto a plate structure like this, we're inadvertently creating areas of high stiffness that's going to attract load uh, that we didn't originally design for, and those can attract, uh, or I wouldn't say attract, but ca cause cracks, uh, especially through cyclic loading. So anytime you're looking at an older structure, in general, if it's riveted and you're looking at as-built drawings and you see things have been added, it should kind of key you off on maybe this is something that, you know, the structural engineer needs to take a deep dive into, see if it's been inspected, see if there are inspection reports. 
Um, so for Corps of Engineer Dam, we have HSS inspection requirements. Um, so if you're working on a USBR or a Corps of Engineer Dam or a large federal agency, you should have inspection reports available um, and you should know if you know the design has changed over time. So this is a, these are all the, um, I guess, contributing factors to failure modes on gates. Um, so if you think of the, think of the fault tree that Brendan was covering earlier, you can kind of think of it in the same way, um, using all these different issues that can lead to a failure of a gate, right? So you could have vibration issues or you could have uh, uh, corrosion issues. So I'm gonna cover some of these in detail. So with a roller gate, um, some of the typical issues we have is like ice damming or debris trying to go under and over the gate. Um, so some of these gates are built with seals on the bottom side. Other gates, whenever they raise a certain level out of uh, the river, you will have flow both over and under. Flowing water creates um, not necessarily negative pressures, but lower than hydrostatic pressures. So you end up having a very uh, time dependent loading condition. And that's creating vibrations on this gate. Um, most of these gates, again, when they're 130 feet long in their shell structures, you know, they weren't designed with finite element models. The main design components were really static loads. Uh, so some of these gates are susceptible to fibration uh, type failure modes. Uh, one of the other vulnerabilities, um, so rack deterioration, it's really a corrosion or debris type failure mode. So again, whenever you have a river level that, you know, it should be relatively stable, but it's going to rise and lower just with the natural course of weather, um, you're going to deteriorate, you know, your pinion and rack. Um, if, you know, we try to coat the steel, it's going to wear out. You have moving parts over, you try to lubricate it, but eventually things just wear out. It's exposed to, or the bare steel is just exposed to the elements and it just deteriorates. And so if you have a deteriorated, uh, mechanical system, obviously that's a, a cause to, uh, take a deeper dive and figure out if it can be associated with a failure mode. Um, so any type of debris damage. Um, impact, barge impact, things like that. Um, obviously, if you're changing the actual shape of the gate, you got to realize these gates are large structural members. So if you dent a cylinder, you just created a uh, sensitive spot where it's going to be more prone to buckling. Um, so these are just things to keep in mind. So a uh, quick case history. Uh, so at Lock and Dam 25 in April 2010, the limit switch failed and the uh, gate actually came off the rack. So you, you can see here on the uh, top photo, uh, whenever it comes off the rack, it's no longer supported on one end and it can uh, suddenly drop. So uh, as a result, the chain, sorry. So although the limit switch failure wasn't caused by an operator error, uh, kind of the root cause that we went, uh, kind of the root cause of this failure mode was the operator essentially was operating the gate and then he walked away and didn't watch the gate travel the whole way. So like the operational manual, essentially you need to, whenever you're operating a, you know, million dollar piece of equipment, you shouldn't walk away uh, as it's being raised to do other things. You need to keep an eye on it, but uh, things happen. I mean, this is really like an electrical failure mode. Um, so barge collisions on navigation structures. Uh, they happen all the time. Um, none of the barge collisions that we have on roller gates and drum gates have resulted in a loss of uh, navigation pool. They're always going to be associated with some economic damage, some downtime. Um, those are your real economic or your real consequences. So again, whenever we're look, dealing with large river systems, they're not um, necessarily going to be a risk to life loss. And then here's a photo of some of the damage that can occur. And uh, corrosion is always going to be a potential failure mode. It's very important to keep gates coated. That's pretty much your primary uh, protection against corrosion. So corrosion is going to do a lot of things. It can affect your um, operation of the gate. If it's your mechanical components or attachments to the structure, uh, corrosion results in the section loss, so your structure is getting weaker and weaker. 
uh, corrosion can become spots where uh, cracks initiate. And if you have a structure that experiences vibration or cyclic loading, um, you can end up having a crack that propagates from, you know, a source of significant corrosion. So if you have a gate that is corroded, um, you always have potential for sudden failures, brittle failures, uh, just from fractures. And then this gate here, this is kind of a funny one, uh, at least to me. Um, so just through the debris and damage of the bracing systems, one day the braces just disappeared. So whenever you have debris that's constantly hitting a structural member, you couple that with corrosion, um, ice loading, just the wear and tear on a structural system, you can end up just felling the members. So this is a case where the members felled, but it didn't really have any consequences other than just the repair costs. But this is a vulnerability because this is not the design condition and subsequent loading um, or subsequent debris impacts could have uh, led to a complete failure. So this is the current uh, inventory of roller gates. Um, there's not much to say here, but we can take that inventory and we can apply the number of failures that we've had over the years and again, come up with an annual probability of failure. Um, so for this gate, um, the annualized probability of failure in, I'm assuming this is the same thing, 2016 was 4.3 times 10 to the negative four. Um, so this is, again, just kind of give you a rough idea of what the failure rates are. And these are failures, so these are incidents that um, led to a sudden release of pool. So we're going to move on to vertical lift gates. Um, personally, these are my favorite types of gates because there's generally fewer problems associated with them. There can be problems. Um, the most significant one is typically corrosion. Um, a lot of these gates are built in older structures where most of the time they are submerged. Um, but they are very robust structures. So even for seismic loading, you typically, you know, even if these gates weren't designed for seismic loading, they were so over designed on these older structures that they can withstand significant seismic effects too. Um, it's definitely something that you have to look into, but just kind of keep in mind that just because a gate wasn't designed for seismic doesn't necessarily mean it's guaranteed to fail. Um, but the problem is these are, they're simple span structures. So like a failure of a single member is typically not going to cause a failure of the gate. Um, you're going to need multiple members to yield um, in order to form a plastic hinge or failure mechanism in the middle of the gate in order for it to actually fail in um, breach, breach a bay. So for navigation locks, uh, we have overhead type gates as well, uh, vertical lift gates as well. So this photo on the lower left-hand side is actually from John Day Lock and Dam. Uh, the photo on the top is from Fort Peck Dam. And the photo on the lower right is from uh, Bartlett Dam, which is a USBR project. So some of these gates are stony type gates, which is really just a special type of uh, vertical lift gate with a counterweight. So it's, uh, it's going to have additional mechanical components that you have to look at. Uh, gates can be complicated, essentially. Um, so vertical, vertical lift gates um, can experience fatigue cracking uh, due to cyclic loading, depending on how often they're operated. If the gates are cracked, uh, we've had numerous instances in the core's inventory of gates uh, experience significant corrosion on the bottom of the gate, uh, fatigue issues from cyclic loading um, just through those vibrations and combined with corrosion. Um, so if you allow the corrosion to continue, um, you know, you can, it can lead to larger issues like shutting down a gate bay, which is going to take, you know, so many gate bays out of service and you could potentially increase your hydraulic risk. So a lot of these gate failure modes can tie into other types. Um, a special type of vertical lift gate is called a caterpillar gate. So this is really, um, instead of having the rollers fixed, the, the rollers are fixed to a chain that's wrapped around the gate. These are used extensively on um, like reservoir projects inside outlet towers, or they're just a very, I don't want to say a very reliable gate, but they have less problem, fewer problems with um, the gates binding, you know, cause you're, you're spreading out 
essentially the friction that a gate would have, like compared to a sluice gate to uh, hundreds of rollers. So this is a table with all the gates uh, that we have in the cores inventory. So you can see here uh, about half of them are used on flood control dams. The other half are used on our powerhouses. So this is an example of an event tree. Uh, so instead of writing out the event tree, it's just in bullet form. And this is an event tree for seismic loading of the hoist house. So just kind of walking through this real quick, you can have a reservoir at a certain level, but it's really the earthquake. So these hoist houses, again, were designed uh, during eras where the seismic design criteria were something of 0.05 Gs, 0.1 Gs, very insignificant. Um, but if your hoist house piers crack, the piers fell in moment and shear, they can collapse. Um, and so they can either collapse on the gate and cause a breach through the through the dam. But most of the time, these gates, again, they're very robust structures. Uh, really, you're just going to lose operation of that gate. Um, and here's just a couple more photos of what a hoist house would look like. Um, so whenever you're going into a risk assessment, for an odor structure, um, if there's any type of seismic vulnerability, you need to really uh, pay attention to it. And you got to keep in mind also that you know we're 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 changing our seismic loading criteria based on the life loss that we're expecting on a project. So you kind of have to have an idea of what the life loss is going to be if the gate fails before you start determining what seismic loads you you need to design for. So if you, even if you have a modern project that's designed in the last couple couple of decades, you know they may have used a very low return period on their seismic um, loads. You know we're designing for a 144 year event or a 950 year event or a 2475 year event. Well, if a failure of your dam can cause you know life loss of 10 people, you may need to look at a 10,000 year event or a 30,000 year event. So don't just limit yourself to the seismic uh, design requirements that are in your codes or just in the design criteria. For risk assessment, you have to consider the more extreme seismic events. And that's where a lot of these hoist houses and other older structures get into trouble is um, typically they can withstand, you know, the 0 0.2, 0 0.3 G events on their own accord. Once you start getting above that, um, you know, the reliability quickly deteriorates. And if you have a dam, we were actually I was talking to somebody earlier about this. When you have a dam with uh, multiple gates, the failure of one gate is normally not going to lead to consequences. Uh, again, you got to look at your project specifically. But if you have 20 gates and one breaches and fails, typically your downstream channel capacity is going to be significantly higher than a breach through one gate. And vice versa, if one gate fails to open, you're not likely going to have overtopping because, again, you can compensate that one gate failure with the other gates. And even if you look at a PMF loading type condition, your increase in return period is pretty insignificant. Um, kind of common practice on a lot of the core uh, risk assessments, kind of the intermediate uh, risk assessments nowadays, is we are considering what happens when some number of gates fail. So that stage frequency curve that's developed um, we'll go ahead and develop curves for different conditions of gate failures, and that's failure to operate or open. Um, so fatigue cracking again, vertical lift gates, um, you know, it is a real issue. A lot of the dams in the Pacific Northwest had issues with fatigue cracking, either of the miter gates or vertical lift gates and replace the re replacement costs of these gates are typically, again, the most consequential consequential um, risk. Um, we don't have any dam failures that led to life loss because of fractures of a gate. Um, but again, it can it can be economic in nature. We're just going to skip that. So we're going to move on to sluice gates. So everybody loves sluice gates. Uh, they're typically what fails a levee system because either somebody forgot to close them uh, or there was a big log, log stuck in the uh, drain pipe and the sluice gate failed to close. Um, I had a discussion last year with uh, somebody at the RMC who tracks a lot of these failures and either not, well, we'll get in this later, but either not closing the uh, road closures or somehow not closing the sluice gates ends up being one of the biggest risk drivers on a project. So they are important. 
Um, so debris is a very common issue on these gates. Uh, typically, they are robust structures. Um, so since they are cast steel or heavy steel structures, you know, they don't have rollers typically. Um, they're just operated with a, uh, a sluice stem. So they're being, uh, you know, pushed or pulled into the water uh, with uh, an actuator. And um, you can end up having different failure modes such as, I thought I had it. Um, you can have different failure modes such as uh, buckling the stem and then you're no longer able to operate the gate. Um, you can have cracks develop in the gate itself. Um, I think nowadays we can't even source some of our sluice gates because uh, the sluice gates that we're looking for are very large, uh, 10 feet. 10 feet in width or, you know, eight, six feet, it doesn't matter. I think anything other for greater than six feet has become a problem because of Buy America provisions. Um, so the newer gates that we are using are uh, weldments. So, you know, think of how thick the members are in a sluice gate. Now we're welding all that material. And so whenever you're welding a thick plate, um, you know, your welding procedures become that much more important. So if you're doing like a risk informed design on a new project, uh, you really need to keep keep uh, that in mind. You know, even if it's a new project, you could already out the gate have a crack. Um, so we're gonna move on to miter gates. I think I have like four minutes left, and this is probably the next most important gate that we need to discuss. So miter gates are common in USACE navigation projects. Again, that's one of our more common gates that we are still designing today because they just work. Um, we have 400 miter gate, 408 miter gate sets or 816 uh, indi individual miter gate leaves. I'm sure this number has increased. Um, the consequences are mainly associated with um, just loss of service and replacing the gate. Um, we've never had, um, well, we say loss of pool. So when I say loss of service, it's just loss of using that uh, particular lock chamber but we can't have loss of service of a gate, obviously through failure of one. Um, the gates can be framed in different configurations, so they're not all horizontally framed. Some of them can be vertically framed. So if you typically have a wide gate or a wide chamber and the gate is relatively short, um, we can use vertically framed members because they're slightly more economical. Um, miter gates are gonna be subject to kind of the same thing all steel structures are. There's gonna be cyclic issues, there's gonna be, um, corrosion issues, there's gonna, and it's a navigation type gate, so there's gonna be barge impact issues. Um, so this is just an example of a vertical frame miter gate. You can see it's a little short guy. And then this would be your more conventional horizontally framed miter gate. Um, so your horizontally framed miter gates, um, all the load is transferred uh, through the coin blocks. So you are essentially loading the gate, you're pushing on the gate, that load is going directly into your lock walls through the coin block. So there's no, there's no uh, structural transfer vertically uh, for your horizontally framed gates. Um, but as that coin block deteriorates, and again, this is another, another thing you gotta keep in mind, you, know, you, you have to look for corrosion of these components because if you don't have good contact between the coin block and the lock walls or your miter block, um, you can start, that load's gonna find a way to get transferred, right? So then it's gonna take inadvertent load pads and those load, pad, load pads may lead to uh, cracks and other issues. Um, so this is just one example, fatigue cracking on a miter gate. Um, so the replacement cost was $12 million. And this is another example at the Green Up Lock and Dam. So this is recent too, in 2010. So again, a fatigue failure of a miter gate arm um, during operation. And then obviously barge impacts are gonna also occur on your miter gates. So we're gonna finish up with an event tree. Um, again, it's just kind of a listing of what can happen. Um, but I'm not gonna walk through this one, um, but I guess the ta main takeaway point is for miter gates at least is, you know, they're robust, robust structures that can be impacted. Um, whenever you're thinking about consequences, you really need to think about, you know, time that the service was lost. Um, oftentimes for miter gates, uh, at least in the core's inventory, 
Um, we have replacement gates that we can bring out to the project site um, relatively, well, I want to say quickly, quick for government, um, and restore service. And a lot of our gates, or a lot of our projects also have uh, two lock chambers. So when you're looking at these structural failure modes, oftentimes they're not going to be a life loss risk driver, but they're still important to, to quantify. So uh, any any questions? If you look at ER 1110 to 8159 on life cycle design and performance, it says that locks and dams and levees will be designed for a hundred year design life. Yeah. And it also says that major structural components will be designed for the full project service life. As a non structural engineer, it seems to me that we don't use stainless steel enough in these. Yeah. Because we, it had no corrosion. So why not use stainless? I know it costs more, but pro prohibit prohibitively expensive to use stainless and welding stainless is very difficult. And we already have problems getting qualified fabricators. If we required a miter gate to be made out of stainless steel, uh, I don't know if we'd find a qualified contractor in this country, <laughs> unless they knew they were the only ones and could name their price. Um, but most of the time we can get that design life just with our coding requirements, like our the coding painting technology is, uh, developed greatly in the last say 30 years. Um, so, you know, we use our epoxy paints or our special, special vinyl paints that, um, that'll last for a very long time. Uh, -oh. <laughs> No, I was just going to follow up with the stainless steel thing. Um, I know here locally, MSD has been purchasing stainless steel gates that are weldments, and they're only getting about 25 years of life out of them right now until the welds start failing. Um, they've been having a lot of problems with them. Uh, and as Cody said, you know, welding stainless is not easy. Um, it's hard to do, and it's hard to actually... Uh, do NDT on them. You can't do mag particle. You have to do dye pen testing. Uh, you can do UT if or radiographic testing. You know if you're doing full pen welds. But you know we try to do fillet welds for everything we can because of the cost. And all you're seeing there is surface indications. You have real really no indication of if it's actually bonded well or not, or if it's fused well or not. And sourcing some of the thicker plates for stainless is also really difficult. Um, so whenever, you know, two inch thick plates are normal on gates, um, it's really hard to get that in stainless. At least, I mean, we can get it. It just takes a much longer time 